In this episode, I have a nice chat with Stephanie, who has a very unique background that got her into pronunciation coaching. She's a trained classical singer. and She shares her journey from music to accent coaching. She gives away some amazing tips on how to take care of your voice, which I love because we all use our voice professionally or personally, and we need to take better care of it. So we finally touch on how being multilingual helps us as language coaches connect with our students and be better teachers. I love this episode, and I'm sure you're going to get some great tips from it as well. I'm Bianca, your personal American accent coach, and I'm here to help you master an American accent in English because your voice is your choice when it comes to how you sound. If, like me, you're in love with languages and accents, then subscribe in whatever podcast platform you use so that you don't miss the very next episode. And by the way, if you want to see the full video version of this episode, it's available on Accent Coach Bianca at YouTube, where I also have videos on movies and how they relate to accents and phonetics. Now let's get on with the show. Hello. Oh, I'm so glad you could make it. This is oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the invite and for letting me come back to it like a month after you No, anytime. Yeah, we'll like, do like... Oh my gosh, time is... Flying by quickly, as you know, anytime you're Absolutely. working on new projects, you're just like, where did the week go? And I didn't get half the things done I needed to get done. Oh, my God. The YouTube thing that I'm starting, it's just consuming all of my time, like all of oh, my I'm... time. I know I'm like I knew my, my brain knew, but I think it's more like I have to redo this whole thing and redo the next three things because I was already already ahead, but it was the wrong format or something. <gasps> yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And huge learning curves with everything. Like oh all God. of the technological things that we've been learning for our businesses mm-hmm. in the last few months is just insane. And it's like every time I think I'm finally feeling good with something, either something I'm using releases an update and I have to learn new things all over again. Mm. Or I'm like, okay, now that I'm at this point in my business, now I need to do this next thing. And that requires a new tool. And now I have to learn how to use that. And then just it never ends. I know. At least yesterday I was thinking, okay. YouTube skills, these are going to serve me for a while, right? But then I th- was thinking back, oh, I remember back in the day when I learned how to design a, a website on WordPress, right? And I thought at the time, I was like, this skill is going to serve me for a long time. I have not done that since, but I'm yeah. hoping YouTube skills are going to last. <laughs> Hopefully that will stick for at least a few years. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm hoping. So cool. I think you have some really interesting topics today. We're going to talk about the classical singing, which for me is super interesting because generally other kind of people in this work in accent coaching or pronunciation, they seem to come from three different areas. They used to be an English teacher or they used to be a speech therapist or they used to maybe be an actor. But singing is not something that most people have a background of. So I'm super interested to hear about that. And I also yeah. think that, yeah, like how, how we take care of our voice is not something you generally talk about with people. And you probably have a lot of insight with that. And then also the background of other languages as well, how that helps you and me and anybody just do this job better. So I'm super excited about our, our topics today. But first, why don't you just tell people a little bit about you? I know you already, just to say, I know you because you were in my teacher's academy and we get to see you off and on sometimes. Sometimes you're moving, you're changing houses, or you get a little bit busy and schedules don't always match. But I've known you, I think you've always been in Germany since I've known you. How long have you yeah. been there? I've lived here for just over five years now. Oh, okay. So it's been a minute. <laughs> and then yeah. so, um, <laughs> It's been a while, yeah. Yeah, I've been in Hamburg in the north of Germany this whole time. An unexpected move for me, I guess. I never really had Hamburg on my bucket list of places Mm -hmm. to go to, but life circumstances, Mm -hmm. academic pursuits for my partner brought us here, and it ended up being a pretty wonderful place, and it continues to surprise me. It's grown on me a lot over time, so... Going from zero German knowledge moving here and then not that I'm fluent by any means because I still speak way too much English in this Mm -hmm. town. But Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah, it it just yeah came out of nowhere, but it was a very good move, a good choice to move here in the end. Nice. Yeah. Occupational hazard, I think. I'm living in Mexico. I've been here, I think, about seven years now. And my Spanish is not also what I feel like it should be because I spend all my day doing stuff in English because that's my job. And so, yeah. yeah, it's a disadvantage that we have when people find out that we are native English speakers and that we teach <laughs> aspects of the language on top of that. Then it's like, OK, we're going to practice English. Yeah. 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 And then just last night, my, my neighbor came over last night and she was like, oh, I'm a fan of yours on TikTok. And I was like, oh, my God, that's so sweet. 
we've been neighbors for five years. And she's like, why is it we don't do more language exchange? And she comes in last night. She's like, okay, we're going to sit down. We're going to do this right now. And it was just like this impromptu thing. And she said, oh, I always hear you because my office is close to like where her apartment is. And she's like, I lay awake at night listening to you correct people's pronunciation. She said, I'm taking a shower and I'm thinking horrible. I'm thinking about that L. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like then that my work like impacts your day to day life. She's like, no, no, it's great. I get, it's, it's like, like passive lessons. learning for her. Yeah. It's just yeah. floating through her window. Uh-huh. <laughs> so funny. So funny how those things like happen as well. And so can I ask, where are you from originally? And we know why you're in Germany and we know like when that happened. But before we hear about like more about you and what you do, just remind me, where are you from originally? Yeah, I'm from the state of Wisconsin. So in the U.S., Mm -hmm. I grew up in a small town of like 10,000 people just north of Milwaukee, which is Mm -hmm. the biggest state or biggest city in my state. Most people, though, when they're not from the U.S. and they want to know where I live, I say, do you know where Chicago is? And they say, yeah, yeah, I know where Chicago is. I'm like, OK, go directly north from there along the big lake that looks like the sea mm-hmm. and you'll find my town because my town is on the coast of Lake Michigan. But it's like a direct shot north from okay. Chicago. Mm-hmm. Great directions. And yeah. yeah, isn't it yeah. funny when you live outside the country? Somebody says, oh, where are you from? We tend to think of the city first, even though they might not have any like geographical knowledge. Luckily, I'm from Philadelphia, which a lot of people know. So that's an easy one. But that is yeah. helpful. <laughs> it's, it's really helpful in that way. But you've got Chicago nearby enough to make it work. So that's yeah. awesome. Well, well, tell us a little bit more about you then. Tell us not into too much detail because we're going to talk about it more. But just the, the overview. Who is Stephanie? Who is Stephanie? Oh, gosh, that's a complicated question, I think. Um, (laughs) For anybody that has been following my business pursuits lately or follows me on Instagram as I've been posting more things about myself, I think people are often surprised at the incredibly diverse career that I've had thus far because Mm -hmm. I'm not doing what I studied for, which is like a big surprise for Germans because they tend to stick with what they studied in their bachelor's degree. Uh That's starting to change in society, but they're very much stuck in what you picked at age 18 is what you're going to do for the rest of your life, which for us Americans, we're very much in that space of we change careers all the time, Mm -hmm. especially in things that are related to what you studied. But I am a former musician. I'm still a musician. I still perform and practice when I can. But I studied music education and languages, took a side break for a little while as a waitress and pastry chef in a high-end restaurant, just because (laughs) I wanted to. Nice. And then came back to the English teaching world and have been traveling around and living in different places, specifically long-term in Spain, Mexico, Sweden, and now Germany. And English education have played a big factor in all of that. But I did also have a seven-year stint as a one-woman customer support department for a Spanish-English online dictionary and language learning platform. I was in ed tech for a long time as well. Um, Wow. So yeah, it's been a little bit of things all over the place. Somehow they all connect, except for maybe the pastry chef part of things. (laughs) But, you know... People who know me know that I'm always good for recommending recipes and giving tips when cakes don't turn out right and things like that. You can't go wrong bringing people cookies when you meet them for the first time. So it still plays a part in my life in a good way. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And we don't always connect the dots, but every once in a while it's like, oh, now I see how that comes into play. For example, I am a horrible baker, great cook, and they're just such different skills that I feel like maybe you have a mindset that's much more exacting. Oh, and, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Whereas, no, whereas I'm more about technique and process and less about exact things, exact measurements. It goes with all the other things and it speaks to maybe how you learn things and how you transmit things. That's my guess. I have thought about that a lot, but you're the first person outside of my own thoughts who has really put that <laughs> into words in that way. And I think you're absolutely spot on with that. That, yes, like cooking is much more technique, but also improvisational. You can't Mm. improvise baking things very much because if you change one little thing, the whole chemical equation gets off and most likely not going to turn out the way you want it to. Mm -hmm. Uh, It just doesn't work. So yeah, there's a lot more planning involved. There's a lot more preciseness. There's a lot more following steps Mm -hmm. in a row and not a lot of like off the cuff kind of going with the flow of things. So yeah, I'd say that I'm a more you know, plan oriented kind of person. So <laughs> yeah. And since I know you a little bit already, I feel like, oh, yeah, that's how I can see it does fit together. You're like, oh, yeah. baking, what does that have to do with it? Oh, no. Oh, no. I think it does totally. Personality is right. 
Totally, totally, totally. A little bit more about you now. We kind of get a glimpse of Stephanie, but you said people who know my work stuff. Tell us more about that. And then I want to talk about the singing too and how that's related as well. Yeah. So I classify myself as an English pronunciation and communication coach. And the reason why I do that is because I love focusing on the pronunciation aspect, the mechanics of how we move our mouths to produce sounds, how we can change the style of how we speak to kind of embody different personalities or personas and things like that, and the musicality of languages, which connects to my roots in music. But I've been teaching English as an additional language for more than a decade now, and I realized very quickly when I started focusing really on pronunciation with my clients, there were still so many moments popping up in our sessions of explaining new vocabulary and clarifying questions about sentence structures and natural use of language and things like that. So I use the communication aspect in my title to show that it's more of a holistic, well-rounded, advanced English coaching that really helps my clients to speak English with the same level of personality that they have in their first language without any embarrassment or hesitation so that they just feel like themselves in English all around, not just based on their accent, but also in terms of their spontaneous word choices and their ability to adapt to conversations no matter the topic. Oh my God, I love that too, because a lot of times people that consume a lot of our media or things like that, they think it's all about like accent equals pronunciation or my ability to connect with people. Oh, it must be this TH thing. And they often come to realize, oh, it's more about how comfortable you feel. And when you're comfortable, then you can connect and communicate in that way. So I love that you have it in the title. That's fantastic. Yeah. Also, the way that you talk about it in terms of the level, and we've got the general American accent, and we've got like how to reach somebody at more of an advanced mm -hmm. stage. Because some people say, oh, I'll do that later. I'll do that later. And it is true that it's something that you could probably start from the beginning. But most of us want to get some vocabulary and then we want to have those spontaneous word choices and feel comfortable with that before we maybe focus on some of these other things or think that we need to focus on them. So I love how you put that. And now tell me a little bit more about classical singing and what's the link there? Because I know you've got some stories to tell. Yeah. The fact that most people when they meet me now don't know is that my background is in vocal music education. I got a degree to be a choir teacher and like a primary school music teacher. I was also on the instrumental track. I played trumpet all the way through university, but that combined with Spanish studies, it was just too much and I had to let go of something. So mm -hmm. as much as I loved playing the trumpet, I felt more comfortable with singing at that point in my life. And so I just continued playing in wind ensembles just for fun, but focused my degree on vocal music. And that really is the reason why I even decided to start focusing on pronunciation in my sessions with my English clients in the past, even before I started saying, I can help you with your pronunciation. That is something I am qualified to do on its own outside of the context of learning vocabulary and grammar. And it's really because I had to learn accents in other languages that I didn't speak as part of my studies for music. And what most people don't know, if they've never met somebody who has a degree in classical singing or opera performance or even musical theater performance, things like that, is that when you are in a university program or a conservatory program to get a bachelor's and then eventually a master's, PhD, what have you, for vocal music, you have to sing pieces from the classical opera repertoire, the classical opera songbook, let's say, worldwide. And the classical languages of opera are Italian, French, mm -hmm. and German. Russian also factors into that, but those three are like the primary ones. And the goal is to sound as natural singing in those languages as possible. Of course, the pronunciation is modified by singing because when you hold out notes for a longer period of time, the word doesn't sound exactly the same. If you think about listening to pop singers in English, sometimes you can't even tell what they're singing about because the, the lyrics are stretched in such a way that the words don't always come out so clearly. But with classical singing, the idea is to be at least as close to how the language would be pronounced in conversation as possible. Mm -hmm. And so singers have to learn the International Phonetic Alphabet, the IPA Ooh. symbols. <laughs> Everybody's favorite. Yes, yes. I'm a big fan of the IPA. I have IPA on the brain kind of all the time. My brain just sees the sounds 
written in that. And I think probably people who are listening, they probably know that we don't mean beer when we say IPA. So maybe you can just <laughs> explain <laughs> That's a what good, IPA is. <laughs> a good point. Yes. IPA is a type of beer. But what we're talking about is the International Phonetic Alphabet. And these are symbols that mostly look like letters in Roman alphabets that we're familiar with, like the English alphabet. There are symbols that look very different than any letter any of us use when we're writing words, but they don't represent letters in a language to form words, they represent sounds. And you can combine them and mix and match them to create the sounds of any language in the world. Now, granted, when I was in school and I was focusing on the pronunciation systems for Italian, French, and German, I didn't learn every single symbol in the International Phonetic Alphabet because there are so many that are not used in many languages. Each language has its own sound system that uses a limited selection of these symbols from the IPA. But I had to do exams on this. Now, granted, now I don't use it as much in my work now. And I will say that you and I had conversations <laughs> about this. For you, you think in IPA right now. Yeah. Me, I'm like, oh, I have to brush up on this. I have to review <laughs> this a little bit. <laughs> but there was a time where I had exams in front of a panel of professors. They'd give me a set of lyrics from an Italian aria, an, uh, an opera song, and they'd say, okay. You've never seen this before. You didn't memorize the symbols for these words. Go write the IPA on the board. And if you can pass this, then you can carry on with your degree. If you can't pass this, we're going to have to revisit something. So I did pass. And there was also a singing component of those exams mm -hmm. as well to show what we had learned in terms of vocal technique. But it was really highly based also on the phonetics of other languages. And now this was before you could easily find a Wikipedia article about all the symbols with little audio files to click mm -hmm. to hear the sounds. Mm -hmm. So I had these copied packets from my professors of pages and pages of like in German, when these two letters are together, this is the symbol you should use. And I had to learn just pages of mechanics and the technicalities behind how this all worked. Now it would be so much easier because I could just go to Wikipedia and click the audio file and I would know, okay, that's what that symbol sounds like. That's when I should use it in certain contexts and certain words. But in some ways, I'm kind of grateful that I had to learn it the hard way, the old school, <laughs> the old analog school. way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, me too. I was studying linguistics and we had to do a lot of transcription. Right. So for people who are listening, when you're saying, hey, listen to this thing and write it in a symbol or even read this thing in English or German or Spanish or Arabic or whatever, and then write how it's supposed to sound. That's transcription. That's transcribing. And I don't know if this happened to you, but in lots of heated arguments about like, no, no, it's this sound. Oh, no, no, it's this one. But nowadays you can be, just play it. Right. And you can come to a consensus. But in yeah. the old days, if you had audio files downloaded somehow, great. But most of us were just bickering over like, oh, is this more of an uh or is it more of an uh? And I feel like even though we have all these things that we still debate about which one do you hear? Because in the end, it's kind of subjective. We're trying to make it very objective, very clear with our charts. But in the end, we all hear things and process things a little bit differently. So I think it's super interesting that we both had this kind of old school method, but yours was an application that's completely different. Because yeah, you often hear singers who, if they're classically trained, they sound amazing. They sound, we could say, near native in whatever language they're speaking. And this is why. To me, it's an unlikely kind of Venn diagram of how did IPA come into your life <laughs> in yeah. the case there? Yeah. So super, super interesting. Now that we've talked about IPA and how the sound is transmitted, and it can be for any language, tell us a little bit about Mexico then and also about pronunciation there. Yeah. So I moved to Mexico in 2016 after my stint as a pastry chef. I had moved there to work at an English school for adults. And this school was very different than any other language school I've ever worked at. I'm still divided on how I feel about this. But they had this course that all of the students were required to take, no matter what level of English they were at. They had to take this pronunciation course before they could continue on with the content leveled mm -hmm. courses mm -hmm. at the school. It was like their entry point into the school. And the whole concept of this class was basically learning the IPA symbols of American English, which it really was American English, even though there were other teachers at the school that were 
Canadian and mm -hmm. British and mm -hmm. Australian, which then just confused students even more. And that's why <laughs> I had problems with like, let's do an American pronunciation class. And then you're going to learn something totally different depending on who's teaching oh, your right. next class. But the thing that I really struggled with was that the students really were forced to focus more on learning the symbols and what they mm -hmm. sounded like and not given enough time to actually just practice pronunciation in the context of normal speech. Mm -hmm. However, it was still a really fun experience for me because I got to do it my own way because I was one of two teachers at the school that knew IPA. So guess who was teaching a bunch of <laughs> blocks of this pronunciation class? It was me. Yeah. And I realized while I was teaching that class that one, I loved teaching pronunciation. I do enjoy teaching with vocabulary and grammar and mm. colloquial phrases and all the other aspects of the English language. But I really love teaching pronunciation probably because it aligns so well with singing and my background in music. It's the, the musicality of language. But the other thing that happened while I was teaching that class was I actually had to modify my own accent because the syllabus, the course curriculum that we had was based on a general American accent. And so there came a point where I was teaching the sounds that the letter A can make mm -hmm. in the general American accent. And we got to really short three letter words like tag, bag, Rag. But when I said them out loud, my students had no idea what I was saying because even though I'm from the south of my state where we don't have a very strong Wisconsin accent, Wisconsin accents have a lot of commonalities with Minnesota, Michigan, Canadian accents, mm -hmm. where we tend to have really flat, stretched vowel sounds. Yeah. So instead of saying tag, bag, rag, I was saying tag, bag, <laughs> rag. <laughs> my students were like, Stephanie, what are you saying? None of this makes any sense to us. It doesn't align with the uh -huh. symbols we've been learning, what's <laughs> written on the page. What are these words that you're saying? And I realized in that moment that I had more of a regional accent than I thought that I did. I always knew I had a regional accent, although most Americans think that they don't have accents, right. which is still funny to me. It's like <laughs> everyone has an accent. <laughs> There is no such thing as no accent. Yeah. yeah. But if you have but, a mouth and you talk with it, you've got an accent. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Exactly. But I had never really realized until that moment that I had certain affects of mm -hmm. that regional accent mm -hmm. that I had never really been put in a situation to analyze it and to realize that not only was it present in my speech, but I could change it if I wanted to. <laughs> I had never thought about changing my accent. Of course, when I was younger, I did a lot of like public speaking competitions. We call them forensics in my state. Uh -huh. And I did a lot of pieces that were written by British authors. And so mm -hmm. I learned like a like an RP British yeah. accent yeah. as a child. Mm -hmm. And I was really good at it at the time just by listening and mimicking. Now I, I'm really out of practice. I, I would embarrass myself if I did it now. So I knew that you could learn an accent from another country that yeah. was so different from your own. But it wasn't until I taught this pronunciation class that I realized that in my normal daily speech, when I'm not pretending to be somebody, I'm not acting, mm. I can actually change how I sound permanently. Mm -hmm. And that was like a huge <laughs> thing for me. Mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Which is what eventually prompted me to do the work that I'm doing now mm -hmm. to help people with their pronunciation and whether they're like speaking with an accent that is so different from their target accent or they're really close, but they need a little bit of polishing. Mm -hmm. Both are really appealing to me because... For me, I was a native English speaker, but there were still things that I could change depending on how I wanted people to hear me and perceive me. Yeah, exactly. It goes so deep. And we say general American, standard American. But even us as native speakers, there are stigmas, there are biases, there are prejudices based on how somebody speaks. And I feel like there's a lot of biases that we're still we're, we're getting over some of them, I think, slowly. But I'll still feel like the linguistic bias that exists there. And how people sound, it's the hardest one I feel like to kind of scratch away and remove. So even as native speakers, we often want to neutralize some of our regional accent, depending on who we're with. Like if we often move around to go to university or we might move to a different state because of our partner or whatever. And so many people don't realize that a lot of us native speakers will also change how we speak depending on the context. Like you said, it could be permanent or how I like to describe it is just taking off a jacket and putting it on when it's helpful 
to you, I think. So, yeah, that's super interesting, I think, for people to hear because they don't often realize that. And you gave a really great example. Can you say it again? There were three letter words. Yeah. I'm going to say, how, how about let's do this. I'll okay. say it. And then you say it in your in your former regional accent. I'm going to spell the word first. B-A-G. Bag. Big. <laughs> T-A-G. Tag. Tig. Woo. R-A-G. Rag. Rig. Wow. See, I'm from the U.S. too, and I don't meet people often from so far west. Yeah. It's actually the first time I've ever heard this. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks for telling me about that. There's something else that I remember we were going to talk about, not just the a sound, but the diphthong of A, how does that sound in your original accent? Like I would say, hey, how are you? A, A, hey. What is that like for you? Yeah, in cases of words like that, it is pretty much the same as how you is it? say it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's really just more that we add sort of a diphthong when we say words like the ones that we just did, where depending on how thick the person's accent is, it can be a little closer to the way you just said it, like bag, which is different than how you said it, but it's mm-hmm. still more of an elongated A sound. Okay. But the farther north you go, mm-hmm. uh, you get closer to Canada, you get closer to northern Minnesota. People think of, if they've seen the TV show Fargo, it's like mm-hmm. that accent. Mm-hmm. Then there can be a bit more of a diphthong. It can fluctuate big, where yeah. it slide through <laughs> the sound. Oh, I went to the supermarket the other day and I bought a bag of potatoes. I don't talk like that, but people in the north of my state do. It's something that I heard when I would travel through my state. My grandparents had a cabin in the northern part of our state and we would go up there in the summers. And not everybody talks like that, but especially depending on if they've moved from other regions nearby to certain areas. You can hear that kind of mm-hmm. inflection in the voices, and they do add diphthongs where other people wouldn't. Yeah, this is such a treat because I'm all East Coast, and so I'm used to New York, Philly, Boston, like all those different things. But I'm hearing for the first time, and I hope people are enjoying this too, like how in that one state, there are so many differences, and you're able to describe it really well. And I think there was one more too about a shorter kind of ah sound. Can you demonstrate what you mean by that? Yeah, I just mean that the general American uh, would have a shorter sound than and what you'll hold use. it. You'll hold yeah. it longer is what we'll, you mean by we'll that. We'll stretch it out for a long In duration. Ah, I got you. Yeah, so so we're talking symbols. We're talking IPA sounds, and we need symbols to represent these as much as we can. It's still not perfect. So we're trying to get close with our IPA because earlier you said the letter A, because spelling in English is such a nightmare that how are you supposed to know when you see this letter, how are you supposed to know which of those sounds? Let's just pick one accent. Let's just say general American from the spelling of the letter to the sounds to the IPA. Then we've got all these different accents too. And we come up short, I think, notating some of these things. I don't know if you had that trouble, but when I was in my linguistics courses and we were doing a lot of transcription, these questions always came up. So I don't know if that happens for you when you're teaching now. Just this morning, somebody was saying the words do and to and you, and probably from your singing background as well, just the duration of the vowels, those little milliseconds, at least us with some training, we can hear that. We can say, just hold it just a little bit longer. Do you have that also, that noticing of the length of the vowels, maybe from singing or at least from your background? Yeah. The interesting thing is with the languages of opera that I was studying and using IPA to transcribe, those languages have much stronger rule systems for what you see on the page is what you pronounce in a certain way. Like there are rules that just make sense. Whereas when you're trying to transcribe English, it's a nightmare because what you see on the page is not necessarily the sound that it makes. And even when you have a rule for something, There's another word that looks so similar that breaks the rule because it depends on how language evolved over time, where the word came from, what language did it originate with, and how it was moved about in different immigration pathways of people and the accents that influenced different areas. Like, for example, in the U.S., you had certain types of ethnic groups that were settling Mm -hmm. coming from Europe. You've got Mm -hmm. certain parts of the U.S. that are influenced by the Scottish English and the Irish English. You've got other parts of the U.S., like where I grew up, were a very German and settled area. And so Mm -hmm. there's a lot of Scandinavian too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Up in the north and Mm -hmm. off to Minnesota. But even in terms of word choice, it affects that as well. Like where I grew up, we used words in English vocabulary that I always thought were really normal until I moved to Germany and started learning (laughs) German. And I realized they were actually German words that other Americans don't use. But we used them where I grew up in my area of my state because Mm -hmm. we were so German and still are in terms of heritage and our roots. Um, 
So that really plays a part in it too. But now the issue that I have with my students, especially when I work with German speakers, is German has also long and short vowels. And it's not the way we think of long and short vowels in mm -hmm. English. Like in English, you have a and a mm -hmm. with your short versus long. And that's what we classify it for kindergartners right. when we're teaching mm -hmm. children long versus mm -hmm. short. But in German, they actually mean like the duration of how long you hold the vowel. Yes, yes. And that then plays into how they speak English. Sometimes they hold things longer or they create diphthongs like a double vowel sound where it doesn't belong. Like they'll, instead of saying two, sometimes I hear two and it has like an ew sound to it instead of a peer u sound because they're pulling that from their first language. And it can be really hard to help them to hear these kinds of differences, because like you said, you can't really put it on paper in a visual sense. And then how long do I hold that? Because it's usually just like a fraction of a second longer <laughs> or shorter. And it's like, how do I describe that? You just you have to hear it many times and then just start to internalize it and feel it. But it can be really hard to tell a student in certain cases I'm sorry, but you just got to listen to this a bunch of times. I'll make you a recording. Just repeat it over and over until it just feels right to you because I don't have any other way to describe it to you. Sometimes you can't really yeah. use words to describe these kinds of minute differences. And you probably with your singing background, because I don't have this background at all. I'm a horrible singer, but I feel like I resort to often, how should I say, Taking the words out of the words and seeing what's the sound behind it. And often maybe for syllable stress, almost humming the syllable stress or humming how long the vowel should be. Maybe with your musical background, it actually is much more intuitive for you to hear those things and then at least create something that approximates what you're looking for. Do you know what I mean? Because I feel like the yeah. words are getting in the way sometimes. Certainly the spelling is, but the words themselves and the fact that I'm trying to make a consonant or I'm trying to make a specific vowel with my jaw and my lips and my tongue. And sometimes it's the sound behind it. Does that make sense how I'm trying to describe it? Yeah, I think especially for me, sometimes it's helpful just to take the consonants out of a word because mm -hmm. if the vowel sounds are the problem for the person, they get caught up in all of the rhythmic things of the consonants mm -hmm. in between. And so then by stripping that away and focusing on ah, yeah, in kind of a sing-songy way can really help them to feel how the mouth has to change shape in order yeah. to produce the vowel sounds that we're aiming for. Mm -hmm. Because I think sometimes the word itself, when you see a bunch of syllables on the paper, there's a lot of letters in front of you. You just get overwhelmed by all of the mess on the page. Mm -hmm. And so stripping things back so that you can just focus on the core sounds mm -hmm. can be really helpful. And that is related to singing because a lot of times when learning new pieces of choral music, like in the context of a full choir, this also works for soloists too, but sometimes, especially when it's a song in a foreign language that the group is not totally comfortable with mm -hmm. yet, mm -hmm. they'll practice it on just a single vowel sound like mm -hmm. ah, or use like a simple consonant vowel combination like ma, 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 mm -hmm. so that there's some sort of initial Syllable attack to, yeah, to help form this like invented text. But then they can just focus on the sound of the music, the notes they're supposed to be singing without mm -hmm. letting the words get in the way. And that concept does apply in the type of coaching that I do as well. It's just I'm not singing with my clients or speaking <laughs> instead. <laughs> You're not performing as such. No. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And, and, and one of my favorite activities is to take away the consonants and just do vowels. And to speak that way, it feels weird and unnatural. It's so effective and so helpful. Super difficult, not easy to do. I've done the exact same thing. And I don't have a name for that like technique. <laughs> like the best I can come up with is let's do it with vowels only. Like vowels only. That's my name for this. But I wish that we had more shared techniques that we could use and give it a name and say, okay, we're going to do this technique and this technique can kind of like standardize it in a way. Because I'm sure you have so many tricks in your bag and I have all these other tricks too. And we have to, I think, come together as a bunch of us have and just say, oh, this is what I do for that. Oh, this is what I do. Oh my gosh, I've never thought about that. And with your background, I'm sure something about pastries will cause you to think of another <laughs> technique that will work. You, you know, never know. You never know. You just never know. Yeah. You need a little more salt on that vowel. Yeah. Absolutely. Let, yeah. Let it, just let it ferment. It's fine. It's, it's funny that you say that though, now that I think about it. Because recently I was having a conversation with an English coach. She's German, but she coaches high-level English speakers. 
And we are exchanging ideas of how we teach syllable stress and things like that are working through really long words that people see so many letters on the page and they're like, how do I say spectacularly or philanthropy and things like that. And so I was talking about how instead of really harshly dividing the words, like as children in school, I learned like to clap things out like mm, philanthropy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But instead, what I like to do, and I described it as flowing through the words, I like to use my hands like this. Yeah. And now I'm thinking like a rolling eating, like uh -huh, uh -huh. We're kneading the dough. Yeah. And so we were talking about this and I was using my hands and I was like philanthropy and scooping mm -hmm. on the stressed part of the word mm -hmm. and just flowing through the words because I do like to get my whole body involved with it. Sometimes my clients look at me like, this woman is crazy. <laughs> But then they try it and they're like, okay, it feels a little weird at first. I don't want to look silly or anything. Yeah, but yeah. then they realize, oh, we're producing sound with our body. Our body is involved with it. So why not use other elements of our movement to help connect our brains to the physical action of producing the sound? And so I'm going to think about that now as more totally. like rolling out the dough. I love that because there is a contour to syllables. So when I think of it like this, now I can think of it like this. Yeah, I'm like pushing that through. See, it, it all, all comes together. It all comes back <laughs> together. Yeah. It all works. So we were talking about IPA. We were talking about your travels a little bit. All of your background comes together to form what you're doing now, which is combining your love of languages and your singing and it actually comes through with the pronunciation and, as you said, like the communication aspect, mm -hmm. right? Because, as we said, that's more holistic as well. Can we talk about now a subject I think that is super important, especially for teachers? I think I had one single class on this when I was getting my master's in TESOL, teaching English as a second language. It one single day where they said, oh, you got to take care of your voice. And I thought, why don't we have more of this? And I probably got a class where the other people don't get. So... This is a really great opportunity. Can you tell us, based on your singing experience, how can we all take better care of our voices? Yeah, this is something that I didn't really start bringing into my sessions with my clients until recently because I just felt like ah, nobody would care about this. They're coming to me for pronunciation. That's what we got to focus on. But then I realized that so many people don't know how to take care of their voices. And I was the same until I started singing semi-professionally. Most people who do not study singing or do not study to be a speech language pathologist or something or an, an ear, nose and throat doctor, anybody who's not focused on that for their career, they don't learn how to take care of their voices. But yet we learn so much, at least now from the internet, about nutrition and exercise and taking care of the rest of our bodies. But even even on the days that we're not exercising, what muscles are we using constantly? We're still talking. Yeah. And a lot of us need to talk for our work and for our jobs. And that is part of our livelihood. This morning, I had a lesson scheduled with somebody. And at the last minute, she said, oh, my son brought something home from daycare. I have no voice today. And so sometimes you can just lose it. But also we need to know yeah. how to better take care of it. And we don't know these things until somebody tells us. And like you said, unless it's a part of your study, you're probably not going to encounter something like that. We see a lot of stuff about other things. So please <laughs> give us exactly. all the secrets. So I, I think the, the easiest way that this connects to pronunciation training is that sometimes we have to help people learning English pronunciation, how to breathe differently. For example... There are a lot of people that don't have a strong initial H sound in their words. I work with a lot of Spanish speakers. And in Spanish, when you have a word that starts with H, like hola, the H doesn't make a sound. It's just not there. It's on the page, but it's not in how you pronounce it. And then when they speak English, they don't pronounce any of the H's. And you're missing that puff of air at the beginning of a word. And so I do like to work on breathing exercises with people and just in terms of feeling air flowing through the body more. This is something singers work on a lot because in order to sing for long periods of time with clear, beautiful sound, you need a lot of air cycling through your body. And not only do you need to learn how to breathe deeply, because people ask me that all the time. Well, I feel like I don't have enough air to finish my sentence. How do I breathe better? And they hear the word diaphragm. They hear, okay, I have to breathe from my diaphragm. If people don't know what that is, the diaphragm is a muscle that's like in your stomach region that does inflate like a balloon and deflate depending on how you're using your air, whether you're inhaling or exhaling. It's not just your lungs that are involved with breathing. But if you just tell somebody to breathe from their diaphragm, 
A, they don't know what that means or how to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And B, it's only a part of the whole picture in terms of air usage, because mm -hmm. not only do you need to learn how to take a deeper breath when you're singing or when you're speaking, like giving a presentation where people need to hear you in a larger room or teaching to a class or even a single person and talking for a lot. But you also need to know how to use the air mm -hmm. that you took in because mm -hmm. some people learn to breathe really deeply and then they use all of their air in the first two seconds. Mm -hmm. And then they've got nothing left and they're talking like this as if they're running out of air at the end of a sentence. So part of what I work on with people also is something that singers do a lot in terms of learning to breathe deeply. And I always tell people to imagine that there's like a tire or a donut around their middle mm -hmm. because you don't just feel it in your stomach. You should feel mm -hmm. it all the way around you. This is also something that weightlifters and CrossFitters learn how to do because you need to breathe deeper in your body in order to pick up heavy things without mm. hurting your back. So honestly, I got really good at this type of breathing, not during my bachelor's studies, but when I started doing CrossFit many years later and I had to <laughs> practice it again and I was like, oh, this didn't click with me when I was 20 yeah. years old. But now later on, I finally get it because in that <laughs> case, I, it was more physical for me if I didn't breathe strongly enough. I was going to throw my back out when picking mm -hmm. up something really heavy. So that's one aspect of it. But then also being able to control how long the air comes out for. So something I like to try with people is something I did many, many times in singing situations is you breathe in deeply for four counts and mm -hmm. then you let the air out on an S sound for 16 counts. And the idea is to not push. You don't want to run out of air when you get to the end of that count of 16. You don't want it to start disappearing. You want it to be equally strong mm -hmm. all the way through. And it's not easy, no, well, yeah, especially yeah. the first few times you try it. It's something that takes practice. So that's one aspect of it is just learning how to use air better. But that's only one tiny piece of it. Mm -hmm. And the other part that I like to do with people is something that I honestly did not learn about until the pandemic when I was really sad that I couldn't sing in choirs anymore because I joined one right before the pandemic mm -hmm. to get back into music that got cut off. And then I found virtual choirs during the <laughs> pandemic, which uh, in the end, I, I got tired of it after time being in front of the screen. But something that I learned during that time from a professional singer from a British group, they're like quite famous in the choral world, but that, that doesn't matter. But one of the women in that group, she had this necklace with this tiny little silver straw attached to it. And uh -huh. I, was, I kept seeing it in videos that she would be on the Zoom calls. And I was like, what? is that mm -hmm. and then she eventually explained that it was actually a tool that she used to take care of her voice and i was like what <laughs> what is this so i started doing a lot of research on what is called straw phonation mm -hmm. it's part of a group of exercises that are called sovt exercises and those letters stand for semi occluded vocal tract and basically, it's just a very fancy way of saying that the mouth is partially closed while you're producing sound. And one really easy way to accomplish this is by producing sound into a drinking straw. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a fancy little necklace. It can be an actual drinking straw, like what you would get at McDonald's in your cup of whatever Coca-Cola or Fanta that you're drinking. It can also be a metal straw. I have a fancy one that's like... I was going to say, it's, oh, look, we're, we both have straws. I was just saying like, oh, I have this drawer of stuff here. And one of the things, oh, here's another one. I have two straws here. Look at that. And one happens to be a little harder. I only know of straw exercises to strengthen the velum, right? Which I use it anyways for nasality. And so that's the only thing that I know about a straw kind of exercise. So tell, tell us a little bit more about how we could use straws to help ourselves. Yeah. Mine is like this fancy extendable telescoping one because different lengths will change the difficulty or easiness of the exercise. Basically, the longer it is, the harder it is because the air has to pass through a longer space. So starting with a short one can be really helpful. This is from a company that sells it specifically for singers and speakers. But I've seen on Amazon, too, that there are telescoping ones like this that are intended for drinking. But you can also just get a plastic straw or a metal straw. Like people get packs of them to keep on hand in their kitchens. It doesn't have to be a fancy one. But the idea is that you produce a tone into the straw. Your lips need to be sealed around the straw. 
-hmm. and you need to make sure that you're not humming. So you can test this by creating tone and pinching your nose because if you pinch your nose, you can't hum because humming actually the air comes out of our nose. But if we're actually singing into the straw, pinching your nose won't stop the tone. Interesting. Oh. And what this does I can't give you the full physics breakdown of this. There's a very famous researcher in the vocal health and sciences world. He's originally German, but he's been teaching in the U.S. for decades. His name is Ingo, I think. I might have that wrong, but he is the one that popularized using straws for straw phonation. And he has some amazing videos on the internet that show these like computer simulations that he's done to show what's actually happening in your vocal tract when you're doing these types of exercises. Mm -hmm. And basically what happens is when the mouth is closed off like that, it creates back pressure so that you have the air coming up from the lungs and the air pushing back from the closed part of your mouth. And it allows the vocal folds or the vocal cords to align properly so that they can vibrate with as much ease as possible. Uh -huh. So it's actually very soothing for the vocal cords because it creates the alignment that we often don't have when we're just speaking or singing. Mm -hmm. That back pressure is what creates that alignment and it allows the vocal folds to vibrate more easily, which is very soothing to them. So this is something that I like to do at the beginning of the day before I start talking a lot. Just for like two or three minutes, mm -hmm. you can make any kind of tones. You can go from like low to high and back again. You can also sing a song that you really like or mm -hmm. something really simple like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. The idea is just to make a lot of tones mm -hmm. in different pitch levels using the straw. If you're not a great singer, it doesn't matter because if you can speak, you can produce a tone. You should be able to create tones at different pitches with the straw. So it doesn't really matter in the end what it is that you're doing into the straw. It matters that you do it for a couple minutes. And then what I like to do also is do it again later in the day after I've been talking for a long time. It's really good for recovery and resetting yourself because there's this amazing effect that if you see these visualizations online of the, the physics of the voice related to this, immediately after doing these straw exercises, having aligned your vocal cords for optimal ease of vibration, they stay like that for a while. The effect continues even when you're not using the straw. It doesn't continue mm -hmm. all day, which is why it's good to keep coming back to it throughout the day. But after doing it for a little bit, it should feel less tense when you're speaking. It should feel like the sound is moving a little bit more freely. Hmm. And it can be great then to do this with the straw later in the day when you're feeling a little bit tired after long meetings on Zoom or teaching many classes in a row just to come back to it to kind of alleviate some of the stress and get that great airflow and mm -hmm. sensations going again. Mm -hmm. It can also be great for kind of cooling down your voice at the end of the day. And for me, I find it's really good when I have to speak a lot, but I wake up in the morning and I'm not feeling so hot. My mm -hmm. throat is a little scratchy. I'm feeling a little stuffy or sick. It's not going to cure me completely, but it makes my voice a lot clearer than if I hadn't done it. This and it, and it helps to make it feel better overall, like not mm -hmm. as scratchy. That's interesting because I've recently developed this little like dryness in my throat that doesn't seem to go away. And I know a lot of people here, they have allergies in Mexico. Something's always flowering. And so <laughs> if you've got some kind of allergy, it's hard to tell what it is. And I'm like, am I developing something in my allergy, in my throat? So this would be a really good thing to try, I think, for me, just to see if I can relax it. Because I often feel that it's a it's a behavioral response to just keep <clears throat> clearing your yeah. throat, which isn't good. And so I, I need to find a healthier way to deal with this scratchiness. And I know a lot of other people have that issue, too. So this is a fantastic tip. What you said really resonated with me, especially about the presentation. You have a meeting at work and you want to just like relax after that. This seems like the perfect little extra, super simple exercise to do that anybody can do. Yeah, because it, it can apply to anybody. I'm actually doing workshops with companies here in Germany that even though they have native English speakers on their team, they're like trainers for the software that the company produces. So they have to go out to sites all the time and talk about their product constantly and one company came to me asking for some sort of a vocal health workshop because they said that their trainers feel so vocally tired at the end of the day, like they're losing their voices and they don't know what to do about it because nobody's ever helped them to figure that out, how to take good care of their voices. And I was just talking to another person the other day 
She has a small business that requires her to go to like trade shows, trade fairs, and present her work to multiple people for hours at a time in a big crowded space where everybody is talking really loudly. She said by the end of the day, she had no voice left because she didn't know how to take care of her voice before the day started, during the day, how to use enough air to make herself sound louder. Or even for me, I was out with some friends the other night and we were in a crowded bar that was really loud. And even for me, trying to take the best care of my voice in the moment as I could, I woke up the next morning and felt like, oh, I, I can't really talk very well. But mm-hmm. you start doing this a little bit and it helps. And I will say, because you were talking about like your scratchy kind of allergy thing, there are two other things like quick tip kinds of things that I, I really love. The first thing is that when I was in my university studies for voice, one of my professors taught me how to clear my throat differently. So the way that you just did it, you know, like when you're feeling like there's a little bit of something stuck in your throat when you have a cold or an allergy, there's like some mucus in there. It's a gross word and it's a gross thing, but <laughs> we're all humans. We all have it. A lot of people go, <clears throat> and you really feel it around your Adam's yeah. apple area. Yeah. But what she taught me to do was more like a stronger swallow that you feel up at the top of your mouth or the top of your throat. And it comes a little bit under the chin here like this. Mm -hmm. And it's not as I'm like pushing down. It's a little bit hard to describe. Mm -hmm. It takes a little practice to get it right. But it's not as abrasive Mm -hmm. on your throat. And it doesn't make as much sound when you do it either, Mm -hmm. as opposed to... (laughs) It seems to maybe align things in a different way. Yeah, and the air kind of puffs out of your nose as you do it. Mm. Do you feel that? Yeah. I'm trying to also visualize it, too, because it's a hard thing to kind of like, here's this sensation that I feel. Let me describe it in a way that makes sense to you. Are we actually doing the same thing? No. (laughs) But to me, it feels the second one feels like I'm repositioning something rather than clearing something out is kind of shifting in the back but for me and it took time for me to practice this i didn't get it right right away but it is something i still have to remind myself of but i do find that it helps when i am really congested it does help me to clear things out of that pathway Mm -hmm. without assaulting my vocal cords yes this very abrasive like explosive kind of scratchiness yeah that happens too and it seems to be a habit thing that you have to really be conscious of and aware of to be yeah. able to do it better in that one way. What a great tip, too. First of all, straw mania, awesome. And the, <laughs> the second one, did you say you had another tip, too? I have another tip, tip, yeah. So another thing that I learned from a professor who had sung in professional operas is that applesauce, apple puree, is mm-hmm. really good for the voice. And I thought that was crazy. She said that actually at one of the theaters that she sang at, they had these little mini cups of applesauce that are really popular for kids' lunches in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They would keep them in the backstage area at the theater, and the singers would shoot those cups of applesauce in between (laughs) scenes. And it it turns out that when you cook apples in particular, but many different fruits, it releases something called pectin. That's how it gets thicker to make Mm -hmm. jams and jellies. Mm -hmm. But especially apples have a a high content of pectin naturally that gets released when you cook them. That pectin is really soothing to the throat. A lot of like cough drops and throat drops have forms of pectin in them because it helps to lubricate the throat more than water would alone. And so I've been doing this for more than a decade now. Uh And I swear she was onto something. (laughs) Wow. It works. When my throat (laughs) is really sore and scratchy, A lot of people are like, oh, I have tea with honey or something. There are certain teas that I really love that are particularly good for the throat. Singers have a few different brands that they love Mm -hmm. that are really good for that. But regardless of where you are in the world, you can either buy applesauce or you can make your own by just cooking apples slowly in a pot with a little Mm -hmm. bit of water and then mashing them or pureeing them. So it's something anybody can access anywhere in the world. And for me, it works so much better than honey. Honey actually dries me out. I think I'm Mm. slightly allergic to it, honestly. No. But the applesauce, it soothes my throat every single time, especially if it's warm. It's particularly Mm. comforting to the throat Mm -hmm. and it fixes my sore, scratchy throats always. And that combined with the straw, that is my ticket to vocal success on a budget, (laughs) very little time without a lot of training. It's something anybody can do. Oh, those are awesome. Yeah. I know there's straw one just for the velum activity, but now, oh, yeah, you're going to feel so much better. It's not just singers that use their voice, let's say, professionally, right? If you use your voice at work, which most of us do, I think these tips can just really help anybody. Just feel better, feel more relaxed, not feel like they have to be worried that, oh, God, what if I can't talk tomorrow at my work? Just 
Exactly. A couple little things. Yeah, just a couple little tiny things. Whether you're in sales or giving presentations, talking in meetings a lot, going to conferences where you're talking mm-hmm. to people and networking all day. You're a teacher in front of a classroom of kids. Like this happened to so many teachers when I did teach in elementary and middle schools in the U.S., teachers that were just shouting at their classrooms all day because the kids were so loud and they wouldn't mm-hmm. be quiet. By the end of the day, they had no voice left whatsoever. And they were like, mm-hmm. what do I do about this? There are things you can do about it, but most people never learn about yeah. this thing. So that is something that I, I love incorporating this into the work that I do now because it turns out you cannot pronounce words clearly in English if you have no voice on the day that you're trying <laughs> to pronounce words. So if your voice is tired or scratchy or not working as well as it normally does, having a a pronunciation session like your client who had to cancel because she was Mm -hmm. sick she just couldn't talk on that day they go hand in hand you have to be able to take care of the voice if you want to use it so yeah absolutely super important Mm -hmm. stuff Mm -hmm. and mostly we maybe take it a little bit for granted until we lose our voice one day and then you say oh my i really do use my voice all the time maybe i even abuse it and yeah you don't want to lose it so taking care of it is a really good what awesome tips now i want to talk about one more thing too which is We touched a little bit on the Spanish thing, but tell me about, not the singing, but the background in other languages, because I have this too. I have a lot of French, some Arabic, now Spanish, a couple different things, and I can see how it helps me in one language, two, three, the more you have, the better. But tell us about your experience with Spanish and German and how that helps you to incorporate teaching your clients better. Yeah, definitely. You can definitely be an excellent accent and pronunciation coach with only speaking one language. I know people who are, but I do think it makes it easier, at least in my opinion. My job is a lot easier because it allows me to anticipate the problems that certain people are going to have. So for me, I started learning Spanish in middle school. So for people Hmm. who are not familiar with the U.S. division of school times, for me, that was around 13 years old that I started Hmm. learning Spanish. And I loved it. I fell in love with the language. I was like, I want to keep up with this. And I ended up getting a teaching certificate in the U.S. as part of my bachelor's degree in Spanish. Lived in Spain teaching English for a while and then many years later moved to Mexico. And it really made it very clear for me from the beginning how important pronunciation can be and how different it can be. Because, of course, growing up, I had this concept in my head as, okay, Americans have one accent with many different variations. And then in the UK, the British accent is really different. The Irish accent's different. The Australian accent is different. But until I really started learning Spanish, I didn't realize how many different accents exist in the Spanish-speaking world. Mm -hmm. And I've spent a lot of time in Spain, which has a very different accent and regional variations of that compared to Mexico. And then all of the Spanish-speaking countries of Central and South America have their own differences. And it can really make things tricky when you're speaking to people from a different country, even amongst native speakers. Mm. It's the same thing for me. Sometimes I speak to people from Scotland, for example, and I have to ask them to repeat themselves because (laughs) I don't catch it right away. Even though we're speaking the same language, our accents are so different. So it made me really aware from a very young age of the differences in accents between speakers of the same language. And then eventually when I moved to Germany, I started learning German because I had to. I live here. It's the language of the country I live in. And even though I can use English a lot in my daily life, Hamburg is still very Germanized, whereas Mm -hmm. I know a lot of Americans and other non-German speakers will move to Berlin, which is a very English-centric city. Even the Germans that live in Berlin speak more English than German most of the time. Wow. But in Hamburg, they're still holding strong to the German language, which honestly, I love. I love that they're still Mm -hmm. very proud of their language and that Mm -hmm. English hasn't fully taken over here. So I had to learn German when I came here. Now, on the first day of my very first German class, we started looking at the alphabet and a little bit of IPA related to that. And my teacher was asking us to read sentences out loud based on the symbols we saw on the page. Now, most of the class was totally lost because he didn't even explain IPA. I was the (laughs) only one that knew what that was. But then he asked me to read something And I just said it perfectly because I had the IPA. And he was like, you just told me you've never taken a German class. How is that possible? And I was like, I had to learn a lot of Mozart and Brahms in my university studies. And I had to learn German pronunciation. And here's some cookies that I baked at home, by the way. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Sweeten the deal a little bit. Brush brown nose a little bit. Suck up to him. But 
Yeah, it really was helpful for me to know pronunciation systems as I started learning the language. And then now, even though I'm not fully fluent in German, I feel much more comfortable living my life in Spanish than I do in German because my <laughs> level in Spanish is quite high. But my level in German, I, I've been relying too much on English here. And that's mm -hmm. my own fault. I need to mm -hmm. take my own advice as a language mm -hmm. coach and push myself to try a little bit harder to brush up on my skills. But It makes it a lot easier when I'm working with German speakers or Spanish speakers because when they make mistakes in their English pronunciation or even their English word choice and sentence structure, I usually know where it's coming from because I know the structure in their language that they're pulling into English that they think works in English, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And it really helps me to understand why they're making the mistakes that they're making. And that makes it easier for me to explain to them different ways that they can try to fix it, not just with pronunciation, but especially like with word choice that helps me to really relate to them in this opposite way, mm -hmm. because I know where they're coming from. But I think even more so than that, I know how hard it is to learn another language yeah. and to keep that language up and to be multilingual. The more languages you add, the crazier the word soup in your brain gets. <laughs> I very much identify with what a lot of my clients have where they start forgetting words in their first language because yeah. their other languages are just inserting words in mm -hmm. the context of a different language. And I know the struggles that come with that. I know how hard it is to learn new vocabulary, how hard it is to hear differences in slight pronunciation mm -hmm. variations. And that really makes it a lot easier for me to identify with them and to come down on an eye to eye level and say, like, mm -hmm. I know this is really frustrating. I know you I've been struggling with this for a long time. I know exactly what that feels like because I'm going through it on my own with German right now or mm -hmm. with Spanish or what have you. And I think it makes people feel a lot more comfortable because they know that they can relate to me and that I'm not this like teacher godlike figure on a mm -hmm. pedestal that knows mm -hmm. so much more than they do. No, I'm here with you on the same level I've been. I am where you are just with a different language. Yeah. And I know what it takes to really make progress. And I know mm -hmm. that's not an easy process. Yeah. And for me, so yes, I have some other language backgrounds, but even when somebody, let's say, speaks a language that I don't, for example, I don't have that much Russian, when there's an error or there's something that's repeated, then that why really nags at me. And I'll have to say, oh, I have a suspicion. I have a theory. Is it like this in your first language? Does that happen in Russian? And they'll say, I, I don't know. Hold on. Let me think about it. <laughs> I'll tell you next week. Let me give you some time to think about it. And I love how, at least for me, on both sides, it just raises this awareness of things like you said earlier. As a native speaker of whatever language, you don't always think about it unless you have a reason to. So yeah, so this has come up and I've learned a lot about other languages too, just by saying, oh, I, I see this pattern. I wonder why it's happening. Is there something in the language? Maybe not at all. Maybe it's just some other experience that they've had, other places they've lived or whatever. But I've learned so much about Russian. For example, you mentioned, I think, vowel duration. Right. Yeah. And you said, I think, long and short. And in Russian, they have hard and soft consonants. They have a hard L and a soft L. So now I'm able to say, look, we have a regular L and a dark L. But if it's a Russian speaker, I can immediately say, but listen, it's not like your hard and soft L because they're going to say, oh, yeah, I already know two L's. Right. We already got two L's. But it's really helpful, I think, to also head those errors off at the path too. the more, you know. So I think it's just The more you know, the more you know, basically. And that less is not more here. Yeah. More is more, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. And as people like us are very prone to, we're language nerds at, mm. at part. Like, we just, we want to keep learning more. We wish we spoke more languages yeah. than we do, but we don't have enough time <laughs> of the day to do it all. And mm -hmm. this kind of stuff is so fascinating. To, I know it is to you and it is to me as well to be able to learn these things, like the style of consonants or vowels that different languages have. And for me... Also, I think it's especially when you look at the word choice and the grammar that then play into that, it really helps you to learn how different cultures think about things, because the way they structure the things that they say, mm -hmm. especially in terms of like common phrases mm. that they have in their language that everybody learns, they might be very similar to something in English or another language. But there's one thing that's slightly different about it that you're like, oh, That's interesting. That's, that's just a little bit different. Or it might be a totally different phrasing. And you're like, oh, that really impacts how you think about time 
or you think about spatial relationships, mm-hmm. how you think about language. Mm-hmm. It's just a really interesting window into people's backgrounds that, like you said, they don't even really think about this because most of us, unless we've studied how to teach our own language, we don't ever really stop to think about why do I say it like that? Why do I mm-hmm. pronounce that word like that? Where, where does that come from? Mm-hmm. We just don't mm-hmm. pause to think about that very often. And I think creating that awareness, like you said, with the people that we work with, it helps them to remind themselves then in the moment when they're about to make a mistake again. They're like, mm-hmm. oh, but Bianca told me it's this L thing that I have something to compare to, but it's not exactly the same. So I got to watch out for this. And then mm-hmm. you, as you work with people for longer, you're about to correct them on something, but then they get to it first. And yes. it's a really proud moment for the people that I work <laughs> with. And I'm sure for you as well. I was working with a, a client today and Germans often struggle to say a hard V sound for words mm-hmm. in English that have a V mm-hmm. because for them, the letter W makes oh, yeah. a V sound, whereas the letter V makes an F sound. Uh-huh. And so instead of saying village, they'll say village, where mm-hmm. instead of volume, they'll say volume because so, mm-hmm. they mix up the letters in their head because it's different than it is in English. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so she said a word that started with V, but she gave me like a what or a f- sound at the beginning. And she said voice, not mm-hmm. voice. And I was just going to let it pass for a second. And then all of a sudden she stopped and she even held up her hand. She's voice. And I was like, <laughs> yes, you did it. And it's just, it's just it's like a triumphant moment for both mm-hmm. me as the teacher and them as the student being like, it's sticking. Yeah. It's in there now. And it's, can they're going to be able to remind themselves and eventually mm-hmm. it's just going to become a natural part of speech. Totally. Yes, totally. You can even see little eye movements or I can see eye movements. Oh, he just looked up into the left and ah, it's that TH sound that he's having having trouble with. And I can see that he's thinking about it and he nailed it. And it's just like when you know the person really well, yeah, I just love seeing those little things that maybe they don't even notice. And I'll say, oh, d- did you just have a cup of coffee? Because you are on it. Or somebody will say, oh, no, I just woke up from a nap. Aha, I think you're very well rested. Like when you know somebody really well, you just know all those patterns. And getting back to the idea of communication and connection, that's the thing I like most. I, I really enjoy it. just knowing people so well in such a weirdly intimate way. <laughs> Open yeah. your mouth, show me your mouth, and yeah, exactly. t- tell me all about your life because I got to get you talking. So, that, oh yeah, yeah, you got you just got things to talk, talk about. It, mm-hmm. it all mm-hmm. comes out then. It's it's yes. like a therapy session. <laughs> totally, it's fantastic too. I feel like I always make friends uh, besides clients. You yeah. just end up knowing these people really well on a level that other people don't know them either. So it's a really special relationship. But I just I love it so much and being able to use those commonalities too and spark some interest. They wouldn't be here if they weren't on some level, some kind of a language nerd. So they already have an interest here. I just love my job. I'm sure you do too. I love working with these things. Can you tell us where we can get in touch with you, where people can find you and how they can work with you? Like where would people go? Yeah, so I've tried to keep things simple and just use my first and last name for everything, especially because I have a very unique last name and Mm. it's a German last name. So for the Germans I work with, my first and last name are very German. Uh, So my my full name is Stephanie Pampel. In mm-hmm. Germany, I'm known as Stefanie Pampis. <laughs> it's just a little different, but so people can find me on my website, stephaniepample.com. And there's lots of different ways to get in touch with me and see about the programs that I'm offering in the moment. I'm always taking on one clients as well. And then my Instagram is another great place to find some more lighter hearted information about me, a little bit sillier sometimes. That's just at Stephanie Pample on Instagram. And yeah, I'm always doing different things because I like to mix things up and approach people in different ways. So sometimes I'm running group classes. Sometimes I'm doing courses on WhatsApp by sending voice messages back and forth, which is one of my favorite modalities. And then Zoom is always a great methodology, a great way to connect with people as well. And in-person stuff here in Germany and and elsewhere, wherever I am, I bop around the world <laughs> from time to time. Yeah. So my website is usually the best place to find out what's currently on offer and to get awesome. in touch with me. And And I always love it when I get new people to sign up for my newsletter because I really love writing my weekly newsletter. I write longer form stories that Mm -hmm. I also record in an audio format. So it's like a mini audio book, like a Uh tiny little podcast episode, like five Mm -hmm. to seven minutes long. And I love to use storytelling to demonstrate different concepts with vocabulary and pronunciation topics ranging from how Americans and British people pronounce things like squirrel and the TH sounds in different regions of the world. But then sometimes it's also a little bit more vocabulary focused or things about myself or 
things that I've learned from clients and other people through my travels. I get a lot of feedback. That's a really fun way to connect with me is through my newsletter. Yeah, I love it. It's so unique to have the audio format too. And I love how it's a very different way of doing things. I totally love it. I would encourage anybody to sign up just to hear your voice. And when you see it written on the page too, to see your style, because I think a lot of us, we need to find the right people for us. You need to know, is this person's humor the right kind of humor for me? And what level of swearing does this person do? And what am I comfortable with? And the personality match, I think is the most important thing. So I hope that everybody takes a look and can find out what you're doing, what you're up to. I remember you were doing like a walking, walk and talk thing too. Yeah, That's yeah. if we're in person. And if I ever get over to Germany, I have a friend who's moving to Spain soon. So I'm going to have to go visit him more often. So chances are we could even meet I up. can meet you there. When oh, the winter's awesome. hard and gray in Hamburg, I can come down to Spain. That's not a problem. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, we can just both vacation there, right? Oh, well, that'll be yeah. awesome, actually. Yeah. So we are going to have to meet in person as well. Definitely. And today was just like, I feel like a gem of all this information because you do have this unique background. Maybe next time we can talk more about how CrossFit fits into that. No, I'm just kidding. But I hear about all <laughs> these little nuggets. Yeah, you never know. And you know what? I got so excited when you mentioned something and I forgot to to just stop you because I was so excited. I didn't know this about you and I bet you didn't know about me. I also was a trumpet player. Yeah, for, really? for years and years. Yes, I could. And yesterday we we're at this party and there was this mariachi band playing. And my favorite is the trumpeter. Always oh, still the show. Yep. Right. And same. I know. I love the trumpeters. And I think I told you this, that I had a brain tumor many years ago and it left me with a lot of paralysis in my face and my lips. So when we were talking about the straw thing, I can't actually get my lips all the way around it. I have to pinch it with my finger a little bit. But yesterday I was like, hmm. Never going to play trumpet for a mariachi band. Oh, so sad. <laughs> that is really sad. Honestly, my trumpet has been collecting dust in my parents' basement for about 10 uh -huh. years now. And I don't really feel very confident when I go back to it. But it is interesting. One last thing I will say, though, two parts to it. In some of the videos that Professor I mentioned mm. has with the straw, he also shows how the mechanics of the airflow through the straw is like when a person plays the trumpet. Mm -hmm. And he uses trumpeters in some of these videos that he has that show how the buzzing of the lips is able to be extended for longer by mm -hmm. passing the sound through the tubing of Makes the trumpet. Mm -hmm. Super, super fascinating. But also mm -hmm. a tip that I have, if a person can't really close their lips around a straw, Mm -hmm. You can get a similar effect by taking like a paper cup and poking a tiny hole in the bottom and then you can put the cup all the way around your mouth because mm -hmm. you'll still get the back pressure. The smaller the hole in the cup, the stronger the back pressure will be. Oh, so if, nice. if you're not ready for a high level yet, you can make a bigger hole in the bottom mm -hmm. of the cup. Mm -hmm. But then that way you can just put it around your mouth to create the seal thing into the cup yeah. and it'll get a very similar effect compared oh, to the cool. straw. Mm -hmm. And you can also do like humming exercises. It'll mm -hmm. give you the same effect. So you don't always have to use the straw. There's a lot of disability ways to do the same kind of thing. Yeah, Love it. Yes, I love the differences in accessibility levels too. And you mentioned pinching your nose. One of my favorite little things is also if you go to like a sports sporting goods store and you get one of those clips that swimmers use on their nose because I find yeah. that your nostrils get a bit raw or you just get sick of holding, pinching your nose there yeah. too. Get a little swimmer's clip, like s swimmer's clip, Never. straw, good to go. Yeah, I never thought about that. That's a great idea. I love there it. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Add that to your repertoire. Then cool. Thanks so much, Stephanie, for coming today. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen you in person, and this was a really great way to actually get to know you much better because there's so many little fun facts and stories that I didn't yeah. know about you before. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to Thanks do it again. So much after for having me. Anytime. Yeah, anytime. I'm very excited. Just to, to quickly recap, we talked a lot about singing <laughs> and how that got you into pronunciation coaching as well. How to take care of your voice, which I love when speaking because we all use our voices and we need to take better care of them, I think. And nobody tells us how. So thank you so much for that. And then last, the way different languages can help us to create kind of bridges in our knowledge so that we can work better with clients and to see where we're coming from, too, because we have that same feeling. I think that makes us better teachers in the end. Not to say, as you said, that anybody who's monolingual can't be a great teacher, but I think it does give us a different depth. Multilingualism just makes life interesting, as I right. find. Well, I, I, I just better. love languages. And uh -huh. the, the weird things that people say around the world in their own languages, there's just so many fun ways to communicate in the world. And so interesting. You know, that's just yeah. what we love doing. We love communicating with people, and that's why we do the work that we do. Exactly. So if you're out there, if you're listening to this, connect with Stephanie, see what she's up to, and we'll see you in the next episode. Hopefully you and I will get together to do this again. Yeah, for sure. I'd love awesome. To. All right, cool. Thanks, Stephanie. See you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Catch you later. 
If you found this episode helpful in any way, please subscribe and leave me a review. It's actually really helpful. And now, before I go, I want to invite you to register and come to my free monthly masterclass. They're on the last Thursday of every month. It's two hours long, and I'm going to help you master a specific American accent skill each month. For example, we've got the glottal stop, or T and D sounds, or rhythm and intonation. So what I want you to do is get on my mailing list, because then you're going to get an invitation every month to come and participate in this masterclass. The email opt-in link is down below in the show notes, so be sure to sign up for my mailing list, and then make sure to come to the free live masterclass every month. I'm Bianca, your personal American accent coach, and I want you to know that your voice is your choice. Thanks again, Stephanie. We all got a lot of great advice from you. And thank you, all my listeners, for sticking around to the end of the show. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now.